Hi, welcome to Hudson's Hacks. Today we're going to be dealing with tidy models and we're going to train a classification model from scratch. So tidy models is a collection of R packages for machine learning which enables you to bundle up the pre-processing steps, the training steps and the validation steps all in one sweet little package like Tidyverse. Okay, so let's get going with the actual task at hand. So first of all, I need to navigate to where my actual directory is stored. Um, so here I'm going to select set as working directory. OK, so I put this in markdown just to take you through the steps so you can see the outputs. So we're going to need quite a few packages for this. We need tidy models, reader, broom, broom mixed, skimmer, remotes, deplier, magritta. Parallel, so we'll run all those packages now. You can see they're all coming into my environment and they're all ready to go. So starting out with tidy models then. So this is a newer version of the traditional carrot package. I've done a demo on the carrot package previously, so please refer to advanced modeling in R for that. So the framework for tidy models comprises of separate packages. So we've got the pre-processing steps, the training steps, and the validation steps. So step one, we're gonna work with a data file called stranded data. This is also available in the package on CRAN um, on the NHSR data sets was created by myself. It's a collection of NHS data, uh, data packages that you can work with. So you can see that the column specification has been read in through reader. And now you can see that actually this is what the uh, it looks like. So we'll, we'll view it in the, uh, the preview pane instead. So we've got the stranded class, so that's going to be our classification label that we want to predict. Patient age, care home referral flag, when, whether they're medically safe, the HCOP flag, needs mental health support, previous periods of care in the last 12 months, an admit date, so when they were admitted into hospital, and a description of the patient's frailty. So that's in. We've got that data. It's ready to go. I've just printed the head of it. So with stranded data, I know that this has got something called a classification imbalance. So a classification imbalance means that actually the classifications that you're trying to predict are imbalanced in terms of the general proportions. So in terms of patients in hospital, not most patients will be stranded. So when I say stranded, that means a patient who's been in hospital, so an inpatient length of stay, of longer than seven days. That doesn't happen often, but it does happen on those rare occasions. So because they're only rare, we're gonna to have to rebalance that imbalance. So I'm gonna use an up sample ratio based off the proportion table of the class imbalance. So I can see that I've got the proportion, so I've got 65% that are not stranded and 34% that are stranded. So I'm going to use those proportions to rebalance them. So I know that actually my, I need to sample by about 34% in the minority class, which is a stranded label. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the data structures. So first of all, I'm going to convert my admit date to a R recognized date format. I'm going to select my names. I'm using the uh, deploy command select if. So I'm going to select my stranded patient if it's a factor, numbers if it's numeric, characters if it's character and you can see it's printed out factors numbers and characters here so okay so I know uh, what my data looks like how it breaks down if you wanted to see this you could see that actually my factors are the stranded class my characters are those that are in the frailty description um, category so in machine learning and predictive modeling in general all data needs to be numerical preferably continuous if you're using regression for the outcome variable. Here we're going to use for the for the categories we're going to do something called dummy encoding so creating dummy labels. But these have already been created in the data for us here but what we're going to do in the recipe step is create them for the frailty description. So the next thing to do is use the R sample package to split the data. So we're going to split the data into a training and test sample. 
So this essentially acts like we're going to use a portion of that data for training and another portion for testing. So essentially we're doing a very simple split at this stage. And I'm going to bring up in a second a presentation just to show you the overall machine learning process. So here, you can see that we've done our data acquisition data cleaning. Now we need to train the data set. So I'm going to use it on a, a, a date, test data set essentially and test that model through that approach. You could use a, a general validation. This is called a validation data set where you evaluate the final data set on the model. We're not utilizing that in this instance, but that's another option that you can provide. Here, we're just going to train it on the test data. So here, you use the R sample package and you specify the initial split. So I'm going to do the initial split on the stranded patient and I'll specify the proportion of around about 75% in the training sample and 25% in the test. We'll run this. You can see that actually my observations have been created to uh, resemble that. So I've got nine variables, so your rows, uh, your columns should match, but your rows will be different. So now comes the part. So we talked about the, the, uh, the pre-processing steps. You'd also probably do data transformation in this, in this stage as well. Uh, I've kind of circumvented that just to shorten the tutorial down. So I'm going to create what's called a recipe. So recipes is another R package that's been created by Max Kuhn and Julia Silge um, to essentially um, do it stepwise. So create features stepwise in your training data. So let's get going with the recipe then. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call my recipe a stranded recipe. I'm going to use the recipe from the recipe package, so the function. I'm going to specify my stranded class as the thing I'm trying to predict against all the data. And I'm going to use it on my training data set. And then I'm going to step date, so I'm going to add date steps. And I'm going to use the admit date, which has recently been converted. It has to be a date or date time format for it to be recognized. And there's some hot codes here. So the features of the day or week. And I put a link into the recipes reference index here. I'll show you what the markdown looks like after this tutorial. And I'm also going to introduce months. So I'm going to get the day of the week and I'm going to get the month. I'm going to step remove the admit date because I've actually created features off of that. So we don't want to include it in the original data. Otherwise, I'll be dealing with multicollinearity. I said it right this time, but sometimes that one gets me tongue tied. And then what we're going to do is an up sample. So we, we created this up sample ratio earlier by about 34%. Because it's got a class imbalance, we want to rebalance it. So that step on up sample will do that. And it says we want to oversample the undersampled part of it by 34%. We're going to use a dummy. So step dummy creates dummy encodings of all the variables. If you want to know what a dummy encoding is, it's essentially this, creates a category label and it will give it a one or a zero, dependent on if it falls into that category. So this patient here doesn't need mental health support. This one does. And it's going to use this frailty description column to create essentially one, two, whatever, how many other factors we've got there. I think there's four. It will create four additional columns alongside this one. So it's going to do that for all our nominal variables. By nominal, we mean categorical and all the outcomes. We're also going to get rid of something called zero variance. So zero variance in machine learning can cause the model to um, to mess up slightly. So essentially what it will do is if the variable is not present, it will eliminate that variable from the training set. This might not be the behavior that you want to happen all the time, but it allows ill-fitting predictors not to be included in models. Next stage, we're going to use a normalization step on all our predictors. So essentially, we're going to reduce them down to a similar similar range of values. This deals with the problem of real severe outliers in your independent variable data. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to print our recipe out. So we can see the operations that have happened. Date features from admit date have been added. Delete terms to the admit data been added. Up sampling has been based on the stranded class. 
dummy variables have been created and zero variance have been done on all the predictors and centering and scaling has also been done on all the predictors. You can see that those steps happening and you can see that in my data frame I've got one outcome, so one thing I'm trying to predict and eight predictors. I did this tutorial in Carrot. There's some other uh, methodologies and tips that I, I share there. I won't go into these. So we've done our pre-processing. Uh, now we've created our recipes. Now it's time to get parsnipping. So parsnip is the model-based part of tidy models. It's where you train and test and validate your models. So train and test the models. So we're going to instantiate the model first. So in parsnip, uh, compared to carrot, where it lets you pass the variable straight away, you need to actually create the object before you use it. So essentially what we So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm going to use the logistic regression in the parsnip. I'm going to set my engine to a generalized linear model. And I'm going to see the computational engine has now been specified as a linear model when you print it out. So you create the model, you instantiate the model, then you create a workflow based off the original recipe that we just created. So we're going to create a workflow. We're going to add our logistic regression model and we're going to add a recipe, which was the previous stranded recipe we defined. If I print those steps out, you can see we've got this workflow being created. And this is what I like about Pass if it starts to create unique workflow steps for you. So we've got the preprocessor recipes at the model logistic regression. You can see that it's got six recipe steps, step date, step remove, uh, step up sample dummy, zero variance, and normalize. The next thing to do is now to, once we've got that workflow built, is to use a fit object. So we're gonna use a stranded workflow based off the recipe we've already created. And we're gonna fit it to our training data. This might take, oh, that was relatively quick, okay? That was relatively quick, sorry. That might, if it's in a random forest or something that's ensembled, take a lot longer. We're now gonna do the stranded fit. And we, what we're gonna do is pull our workflow coefficients back, our fit values. This will vary dependent on the model you use. And we're going to tidy that so it falls into a nice data frame. And then you can see the, the uh, log odds. You can see the, the standard error. You can see the, the T stat and the P value as well. So that's a frequency distribution, a T statistic. It links to the T distribution. The P value uh, indicates significance in terms of the tails. So the, the lower the P value, the better is normally the terminology. Some people don't like p-values, you could use the, the probability on the t-distribution if you wanted to use that for selecting uh, your unique variables. In this instance, I'm actually going to use the p-value, so you statisticians out there don't shout at me. And I'm going to use plotly to see if values are significant or not. You can see I've got this chart, a lot of them are un insignificant apart from the ones that are really significant around the previous periods of care. So we seeing that that variable has got a real uh, connection to our thing that we're trying to predict, suggests uh, auto correlation really in terms of time series methods. Okay, step seven, predict with the holdout test set. So we've got this test data set. We've done the training to train the model on the, the large proportion of the data. Now we're gonna test the data with a uh, a predict method. So essentially we're going to treat this like we've never seen this data before. This is completely new data that the model's never seen before to evaluate how well the model performs at on with unseen data. So we're going to use class predicts. So it will bring back the class predictions. We're going to use prob predict, bring back the probabilities. So the probability of not being stranded versus being, it being stranded. I'm going to combine them into one data frame called linear, uh, logistic regression predictions. And then I'm going to bind those calls together with the original test data. So you should have the print stranded. If I do this, this will be the combined data set with the original test data. You'll see towards the right hand side, this will be appended. You've now got on the original data that was passed through the uh, class predictions and the probabilistic predictions as well. Okay, so I've got all that data, I know it's all good. 
Next step is to use another one of um, Tidy Models packages called Yardstick. So Yardstick's a way to assess goodness of fit in terms of your test data. So you can see that we've got this rock plot. It's developed, a, it'll show you an accuracy as it starts to change. We're starting to see around about 77% accuracy before it starts to curve off. And we can see that actually the model's a pretty good fitting model. It should be able to perform really well in the wild. I say wild. That's got a rock plot. The next step, and that's easy to implement, you literally just use the rock curve function. Specifying the truth as the actual stranded class. And the, the predictions are those that aren't stranded. I like rock plots, but they can sometimes be confusing to a beginner. So we're going to use the confusion matrix. I've done a tutorial on confusion matrices, but essentially this is how you interpret it. Overall, the model is 78% accurate. Sensitivity relates to the thing that you're trying to predict. So the stranded label, so the true positive. It's really good at predicting whether a patient's stranded. And set specific specificity can't say that word Spef specificity is 75.2 percent so actually it's relatively well balanced and you can get that from the balanced accuracy so specificity means those that aren't stranded it's relatively good at predicting those as well so i've developed a package that's available on github called confusion table r which essentially lets you visualize the outputs of the confusion uh, confusion matrix. And as you can see, it will give you a nice um, output for bi binary classification tasks, whether it's stranded or not stranded. It will you will have that potential to lay it out in a nice confusion matrix. It will also create that in a data frame, line by line. And the reason I've created this is with machine learning, you tend to want to monitor your model performance over time. So that can then be ported into a database so you can evaluate your model every time you retrain it. I've also added in a timestamp. So every time you retrain, you'll get a unique timestamp. OK, in the next tutorial, what we're going to do is at the end of this one, initially, we're going to save our data into our stranded data table. And then in the next in the next tutorial, we'll resume where we left off. OK, thanks, guys, and I'll see you on the next tutorial.